In this lesson, we're going to be taking a look at basic data wrangling. And data wrangling is in fact a technical term referring to the process of tidying and manipulating the data so that we can easily extract from it the answers to whatever scientific question we might have in mind. So without further ado, let us get going. We will start by loading the tidyverse. And let us just take one quick look at the standard message that gets printed whenever the tidyverse is loaded. So as the first thing, you see all those core packages that are being loaded together with the tidyverse. And some of these we have already seen. The reader package, for example, is the one responsible for implementing read dilim and write dilim and all those functionalities that are responsible for implementing writing data or reading data from disk. Then we've also seen some of the tibble package. We've worked with tibbles and we've seen functions like tibble and tribble, which allow us to create tibbles. But today we're going to be looking at the dplyr package. So all the functions that we're going to be working with today are parts of this package called dplyr. So as it has become a bit of a habit of us by now, we shall use the Galapagos land snail data as illustrations for all the functionalities that we're going to be learning about today. So we begin by loading this data set and assigning it to a variable called snails. So we're going to be using the land snail data set for our further investigations. Before diving into the details of how each of the functionalities work that we're going to be learning about today, let us talk about the things that are in common between all of them. So the functions in dplyr are designed in a transparent and consistent way so that all of the functions follow the same basic pattern. In particular, each of the functions take the data in the form of a tibble as their first argument and the subsequent inputs to the function, those control how the function exactly should do the job that it's supposed to do. And the output produced by these functions is also always a tibble. So again, the input is always a tibble, that's the first argument. The subsequent arguments do the fine control over how the functions should operate, and then the output from the functions is also always a tibble. So we're going to be taking a look at two groups of functions today. Broadly, the first group operates on columns and the second group operates on rows. So the functions that operate on columns and that we're going to be taking a look at are called select, rename and mutate. And those operating on rows are called filter, slice, arrange and distinct. So let us take a look at each of these in turn. The first function we're going to be looking at is called select and select chooses columns of a data set. So the way it works is we write down the name of the function, select, and then the first input to the function, as with all of these functions, is the data set that we're working with. So we're working here with the Galapagos land snail data that we've assigned to the variable snails before, so that is the first input to the function. And the next input to the function is the name of the column that we want to choose. So if we want to choose the species column, then we write down species and as you can see all the other columns were dropped and we're only left with the column species in this data set. It is possible to choose multiple columns at the same time as well. If we want to do that then we just have to specify a vector of column names like you see on the slide. If we specify the vector of habitat and species then those two columns will be selected. Additionally, it is also possible to unselect columns in the same way. And in order to do that, all we have to do is to prepend the vector with an exclamation point. So it looks a little bit like the logical not operator, although it has a different role in this case. So what this means is do not select those columns, choose all the others. So if we prepend the vector of habitat and species with the exclamation point, then those two columns will be deselected from the table and therefore we're left with only size and shape. The next function is called rename and it does pretty much what it says. It changes the names of columns in a table. So like any other function that we are going to be talking about today, it takes the data as its first input. And then in its next input, it follows the pattern of new name equals old name to replace the name of a given column in the table. In this particular example, we are replacing the habitat column 
by the name of zone. So as you can see in the output, there's no more habitat. Instead, the first column is called zone so that now we can talk about humid and arid zones in which these snails appear. It is also possible to rename multiple columns. In that case, one just has to separate the different renamings by commas. For example, if we want to capitalize each of the column names, make them start with a capital letter, we can do what you see on the slide. Capital H habitat equals lowercase habitat, capital S species equals lowercase s species, and so on and so forth, which will replace the lowercase names with the uppercase names. And as you see in the output, now each of the column names start with a capital letter. The next function is a very important one that allows us to create or modify columns based on the values in the table itself. So before diving into this function, which is called mutate, let's just take one more look at our original table. And let's assume that what we want to do is rescale one of the columns, say the size column. For example, imagine that the entries of size are given in millimeters. Just a side note, they aren't, don't worry about what the units actually are, but for the sake of example, let's just assume for now that they are in millimeters. So let's assume that they're given in millimeters and we want to rescale them to be in centimeters. So the way we would do that is just divide each of the entries in the size column by 10. And these are the kinds of transformations that mutate allows us to do. Here is how we would do this in R. So we write down the function name mutate. As always with these functions, the first input is the table that we want to manipulate. And then we write down the name of the column that we want to create. So in this case, let's just call it size underscore scaled because it's going to be a rescaled version of size. And then an equals symbol. And then we write down the operations that we want to perform, which in this case is dividing each of the entries of the size column by 10. Important note. Whenever we refer inside dplyr functions and in, within the mutate function in particular, whenever we refer to a column by its name, what we mean is all the entries as a vector in that column. So when we write down something like size divided by 10, what that actually means is that we take all the entries within the size column as a vector and divide each of them by 10. So that is why this works and that is why in the size underscore scaled column that you see on the slide, which was newly created, uh, each of the entries is one tenth of what the, the entry in the original size column used to be. Incidentally, it is not obligatory to create a new column. One can also modify already existing columns. For example, if we just said size equals size divided by 10, then the original entries of the size column simply get overwritten by the transformation. And as you can see, now size has changed from what it originally used to be. And now every entry is one tenth of what it used to be. Let's take a look at another example. Let's say that just to indicate which shells of these snails are large versus not so large, we're going to introduce an arbitrary threshold, say 20. And if size is larger than 20, then we're going to consider those shells large. Otherwise, we're going to not consider them particularly large. So one way we could do that is using the if else function. So we say large shell, which is going to be the name of our new column, equals. And then we're going to be using an if else such that if the entry in the size column is larger than 20, then this function should return the character string yes, otherwise it should return the character string no. And as you can see, a new column has been created that is called large shell and it has the type of character string. And whenever the corresponding size in the given row is less than 20, then it says no, otherwise it says yes, and you can see examples of both in this table. So this pattern of using if else inside a mutate to create a new column is actually a very common one. So this is good to commit to memory. It does come up quite often in a data analysis workflow.
As our final example for mutate today, let's take another rescaling, but one that is a bit more complicated than just dividing by 10 or in general multiplying by uh, just some constant. So what we're going to be doing here is rescaling the entries of the size column in such a way that first of all, they should be dimensionless, so the units should cancel and in such a way that the actual values should be strictly between 0 and 1. So how can we achieve this? So let's create a new column called norm size for normalized size. And let us take a look at how we actually compute it on this slide. So the computation begins by subtracting uh, min of size from size. So size minus minimum of size. What does this do? Let us remind ourselves that when we write down the name of a column, what that refers to is the values inside that column as a vector. So when we write down size, that means all the values inside the size column as a vector. And when we subtract off from that the minimum of size, and what that does is that the minimum function will go through the size vector and pick out the one single entry that is the smallest among them. So size minus minimum of size will return a vector where from each entry in the size column we subtract off that minimum value. If you think about it, this ensures that the smallest number now in the column will be zero. Okay, that's nice. The smallest entry is now indeed zero, but the largest entry, of course, does not need to be one. How can we achieve that? We can achieve that by dividing this difference with the difference of the absolute largest value in that column minus the absolute smallest one. And if you think about that, this division will indeed result in numbers that are between strictly zero and strictly one. So that is what the denominator does in the expression that you see on the slide. We have maximum of size, which is a single number, namely the largest entry in that column, minus the minimum of size, which again is just a single entry getting back that minimum. And then the difference of those two numbers is also just a number, and we divide the difference of size minus minimum of size with that difference and that yields us the norm size column and as you can see from the first six entries at least that are on the slide that they are indeed all of them in between 0 and 1. Okay, so this concludes our discussion of functions that manipulate columns. So let's now turn to those functions that manipulate rows. Amongst them, we have the most important one, which is called filter. And what filter does is it keeps certain rows from the data set and discards others based on some logical condition. So let's take a look at how this works. As with all the functions, its first input is the data set that we want to filter from. And then its second input is a logical condition that evaluates to either true or false for every single row in the table. So here, in the example that you see, we ask the question whether the entries of the size column are larger than 30 or not. And the way filter works is that only those rows are kept where this condition is true. The others are discarded. So as we can see, the output from this filtering is actually a very diminished table. Instead of the original 223 rows, it only has five rows left. Only five of the snail individuals in this data set have a size that is larger than 30. Incidentally, all of them belong to the species Unifasciatus. The logical condition that we specify could in principle be arbitrarily complicated, Let's just take a look at one example that's slightly more complicated than what we see here. So for example, what happens if we want to keep all those rows from the table that belong to either the species nooks or the species calvus, but discard all the other species? We can do that with the or logical operator. So we write down species should either be equal to nooks or species should e be equal to calvus. And uh, as you see from the output, we get a table with 90 rows only, uh, namely those rows where the species entry is either calvus or nooks, all the others have been discarded. At this point, it's probably worth mentioning that there are some common mistakes that can happen when trying to filter in this way. One of the mistakes that is very easy to make is to forget that we are talking about logical equality as opposed to setting something equal to something else. So if we write 
down a single equality sign, that will not work. Because if you remember, that means setting some function argument equal to some other value. But no, what we want here is a logical equality because we need to get back true or false for every row to know which rows we should discard and which ones we should keep. So if we forget to do that and only write out a single equality sign, we get an error and this will not work. The solution is very simple. We have to change the single equal sign to the double equal sign, the logical equality. The other common mistake is to try to think in English as opposed to in R-ish or whatever we should call it. Namely, write out the thing that on the face of it sounds very logical, which is to write out species equals either Nux or Calvus. Unfortunately, this doesn't work for the following reason. The OR operator, the vertical bar, works in such a way that the expressions on both sides of it must be logical. So species equals equals NUX is a proper logical condition. It either evaluates to true if a given species in that column is equal to NUX, or it evaluates to false if it isn't. But on the other side of the OR symbol, Calvus, that's just a character string. And it makes no sense to perform a logical operation on a character string. And that is why this will throw an error. This will not work. Again, let me just go back to the previous slide. This is how we have to do it. We have to write it out fully. Species equals equals NUX, which evaluates to either true or false. Or species equals equals Calvus, which again evaluates to true or false. So now we can combine them with the OR logical operator as usual. Let me just go back here. So again, this will not work. Do not do this. To make things even worse, sometimes when you try to do this exact same mistake, R will not throw back an error, but instead do something unexpected that you do not want and do not intend. Let us take an example. For example, what happens if you want to pick out only those snail individuals from the data that either have size exactly equal to 20 or their size exactly being equal to 30? So naively, you might write down size equals equals 20 or 30. This does not work for the same reason that we've discussed, but confusingly, this does not result in an error. Instead, you get back a valid result, but as you see, this is actually the full table. Because if you look at the number of rows, it's 223. So nothing has been discarded from this table. Clearly, this did not work. If you look at the size column, you see all sorts of numbers there that are neither 20 nor 30. So what on earth has happened here? Well, what happened is that R has a quirky kind of feature or behavior, let's just put it this way. Namely, it treats the number zero as false and any other number as true. So when the computer sees this expression, size equal equal 20 or 30, the way it interprets it is first of all, it evaluates whether the size is equal to 20. Very often, if not in all of the cases, this will be false. But then it will say or 30, but 30 is just a number which is a non-zero number, therefore that evaluates to true. And anything or true is equal to true, meaning true or true is true and false or true is true, which means this whole logical expression will always evaluate to true no matter what size is. And that's why all the rows have been retained here. So beware of this problem. The way to avoid it is to actually be explicit and write out the filtering condition as size equals 20 or size equals 30. And then you can see that actually there are no rows in this table that uh, with snails that have a uh, shell size that is either exactly 20 or exactly 30, which makes sense because there are always decimal points to consider, so it was an unlikely thing to begin with. All right, our next function that we're going to be discussing is called slice. Slice is like filter in that it chooses rows of the data, but it is much more simple because instead of using a logical condition to choose rows by, it simply chooses rows by index. So for example, if we want to choose the first three rows of the data set, then we just have to give it as the second input to the function, the vector one, two, and three, which is exactly what we do here because remember the colon notation, one colon three stands for the vector one, two, three. So those three rows will be chosen. So we get back a table with only those three rows.
or we can specify any vector in fact. For example, here we want to pick out the first, the fourth, the fifth, and the 127th rows of the data set, and that is exactly what we get back. Uh, incidentally, you see that there are these numbers at the beginnings of the rows, one, two, three, and four. No, those do not refer to the row numbers in the original data set. Those are just helpers for the particular table that we're looking at right now. So no, nothing has gone wrong. These rows that we see on the screen are indeed the first, fourth, fifth, and 127th from the original snails data set. Everything is fine. The next function is called arrange, and what that does, it sorts the rows of the table based on the values of some variable. So here is an example where we sort the snail's data set by its shape column. And what that will do is it will take the rows and the first row will become the one with the smallest value of shape, the next one will become the second smallest and so on up to the largest value. And you can see that this ordering is actually maintained in this case. One can also sort columns by character string columns, in which case alphabetical order will be automatically preserved. So in this case, if we sort by species, then, well, uh, the Calavus species is the first alphabetically among all the other species that are in this data set. So the first rows will correspond to that species. Incidentally, if we want to reverse the order, so instead of in increasing order, we want to sort in descending order, we can do that with a small little helper function that is called DESC, short for descending. So if we arrange the snail's data set by descending order of species using this DESC function, then as you can see, the first species that appear are those that are last in the alphabet, in this case that happens to be Eustolatus. One can also arrange the rows based on multiple columns. And what that means is that we try to sort by one of the columns. And if there are any ties that is equal values within that column, then we break those ties based on the values in the next one. Here's a small example. We want to arrange the snail's data set based on species primarily. And then if there are any ties with respect to species, then arrange by size. So because we sort by species first, the uh, first rows will all correspond to the species Calavus that come first in the alphabet. But within Calavus, there's no guarantee that the sizes will be in increasing order. But now they are because we've specified that our second sorting variable should be size. And therefore, within every species, the sizes are strictly going to be increasing. Finally, the last function that we're going to be talking about today is called distinct. And distinct takes the table as its input and it will simply deduplicate its rows. That means that if the data set has rows that are identical to one another, it will only keep the first occurrence and throw away all the rest. So let's look at a simple example of how we might use distinct in practice. For example, we want to say how many species there are in the data set, how many distinct unique species there are and what are their names. So one way one could try to get at this, although it's a bit naive and we'll see shortly why, is as follows. First of all, we drop all the columns except for the species column. Remember, the select function chooses columns from a given data set. So we're left with only the species column, and therefore then we call distinct on that, and that should throw away all the duplicates, and therefore we should end up with a table that has one unique row per species. Unfortunately, this does not quite work, and it is important to understand why. Namely, all of these functions work just like any other function, namely they take in some data, and then they produce some output. They do not modify their inputs. So the input to the select function is the snail's data set. And then the select function produces an output, which only has the column species. But unless we do something to it, for example, assign it to a variable, it will promptly forget the result. Just like with any other function, for example, square root, if we type in square root of nine, we get back the result three, and the result is promptly forgotten unless we assign it to a variable. That is, in the code that you see on the slide, when we invoke distinct, 
on snails that will operate on the original unchanged snails data and therefore it will try to deduplicate the table that has all four columns intact and none of them are duplicates of one another so this will simply not work. Instead, we have to do something slightly different. Let us go step by step. So first of all, let us first just select the species column. This is how we do that. So far, so good. So we end up with a table that has a single column, which only has the species. And now we can apply the distinct function to this particular table, which means we're going to wrap the distinct function around the select function which selected out the columns. So is it clear what this does? So first we evaluate select snails comma species which results in a table with a single column and then we apply distinct to that result and therefore we end up with a table which as you can see on the slide only has seven rows each of them corresponding to a single species and we see the individual names of each of these species so we have solved our problem we see that there are seven species in this data set and their names are Eustolatus, Calvus, Nux, Galapaganus, Unifasciatus, Invalidus and Rugulosus. Incidentally, notice how well the different dplyr functions can work together. So precisely because each of them take a tibble as their input and produce another tibble as their output, they can be very nicely chained together. In this particular example, we start with the snails dataset. We apply the select function to it, choosing only the species column, which will return another tibble, a modified one, with only that one single column. And to that we apply the distinct function which we can do because distinct again takes in a tibble as its input. So this composability of the different dplyr functionalities is a very powerful feature and in fact in the next lesson we're going to be seeing how we can make it even more efficient and even more transparent. So that was it for today. Thank you very much for your attention and I will see you next time.